Hi, my name is Willem Weber from SHS with Hospitality Solutions. I'm today's guest on techtalk.travel. Travel. Today's guest is Wilko Weber from um, SHS. Wilko, great to have you on the show. Thanks hey, for joining us. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. Wilko, let's get started by talking a little bit about what you do in terms of SHS and um, obviously what you're focusing on with SHS is education. It's a big part of what you do. Yeah. And I also understand as well that you're working now or you're associated with the European Center of Revenue Management mm -hmm. and Education. Why don't you give us a little bit of a, um, a background on that and, and tell us a little bit about that because I think that's quite an interesting piece okay. given the education part of it. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, well, basically it's, it's explained in two sentences. SHS, we're, we're a nice, uh, very small um, startup uh, in consulting for the hospital industry based in Switzerland. Um, we're a team of 10 consultants and a bit of back office um, and we are half ex-corporate head office revenue distribution roles and we're half ex-OTA and we brought these two mindsets together to play around with what can we achieve. And we're offering this service um, to mainly individual hotels um, in the German speaking markets, that's about 80% and we're very very much focused on, on the Swiss market especially, except the French speaking part, I'm sorry. Um, the interesting thing is when we started classic consulting, we felt like this is not a very sustainable model, so we changed it into something we called coaching. Um, coaching means it's a mixture of consulting elements, of project management, but also of education uh, in a face-to-face -face, um, situation. While we were doing this, one of the problems was that the revenue manager is not a defined job role. I mean, we've got job roles for the, for the chef, for the waiter, for the person cleaning the room, but for the revenue manager, it's just like, oh, you got promoted your revenue manager now, congratulations, and you don't know what to do. So um, we were, got involved with this initiative, which is called the European Center for Revenue Management Education, which defines a European standard for that job role. Okay. Um, and uh, we got involved in kind of training that and educating that model in, in universities, hotels, schools, uh, hotel groups, um, but also um, kind of offering that to the market. So uh, since this year, we've got a daughter company, SHS Academy, which is fully focused on education in the fields of revenue management, um, a digital marketing, and well, let's see what's coming down okay. the road. Okay, yeah. good. So essentially, when, when people want to be a part of that or, yeah. or, or get schooled from that type of um, environment, mm -hmm. Do they need to come with a background in revenue management or can they just come with zero background, zero understanding? Well, uh, it's a good question. We've got both. Um, okay. We've got people who actually come out of a front office reservations background who got, will be promoted or got promoted into that role. Right. Um, and we take them through a, a, a five module kind of course, which brings them to the level of being an on property revenue manager. But we also got an advanced level uh, where we actually meet and interact with uh, senior people who've got a lot of experience or multi-property background, so cluster regional mm. or corporate roles, mm. um, and uh, where we got a mixture of, of inputs um, and discussions and cases uh, on new topics that really drive all of us. Mm. And that's, that's one of the most fascinating things because um, even though I'm moderating part of it, I'm learning as much as the participant. Mm -hmm. Good, good yeah. stuff. Um, okay, great. Let's um, shift gears a little bit and talk about, uh, in terms of um, the Swiss space. I mean, you're yeah. based out of Switzerland. You're in a multicultural yeah. um, area there with the Italian side, the French and the Germans. What kind of influence does that have on, on hospitality in Switzerland? I mean, obviously the Swiss are very well known for being masters of hospitality. Um, they create, they've got good hotel schools, they create good hoteliers, they've got great hotels. What's, what's the secret sauce out of Switzerland? It's interesting. Um, we used to have a secret sauce that worked really well for 150 years of heritage. Uh, which was uh, grand hotels, um, like these palaces and, mm -hmm. and so on that you probably referred to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had like these hotel schools like Lausanne, Lucerne and so on that have a tradition of over 100 years. 
Um, I think we're um, the interesting thing is for for generations Switzerland has been educating the the world leaders in hospitality, and Cornell of course. I'm alumni also of that school, so not to forget about it. But the the problem was that. Um, we're still based uh, on the legacy of that heritage. So a lot of the things we do do not work in today's environment. So Switzerland is um, at a very, very interesting point at the moment where we try to preserve what's good from the heritage side, but also to update that. And, and we see ourselves a little bit more like the, the hospitality next generation, yeah. um, trying to get new ideas and new thinking into these traditional things. So, um, for instance, we've got, uh, when we started, um, it was a no-go for a five-star palace hotel to have a revenue manager. That was kind of, kind of not chic, uh, changing rates and dynamic. And oh no, we don't we don't sell through the internet. Uh, we only sell directly because that personal interaction is so important. And we learned that five-star hotels today, um, the guests have changed. They like to book online. Mm. They like to have something dynamic. Um, uh, the hotels on the other side need to be more dynamic to survive. And we got a lot of five-star hotel clients, which, which look like very old school from the outside. But from the inside, they're also in that process of rejuvenating uh, uh, the, the entire space. And also, we, we shouldn't forget, we've got great five-star hotels, or even in Switzerland, where you don't have a dress code for dinner anymore. That was a no-go a couple of years ago. When I went to hotel school, I mean, hey, coming to dinner in a five-star hotel, that was at least five-course dinner, and you should really respect the dress code, otherwise you were not allowed into the restaurant by the metro. Mm -hmm. the metro. So what you're saying is um, perhaps things are changing, they're becoming more modernized in yes. the sense that they're, they're, they're loosening yeah. the, the strings a little bit. Yeah. Because it, it, yes, historically, it is very much a conservative, if you like, environment. Yes. Um, so it's interesting, it's good to hear that you yeah. say that, that at, if you like at the heart of, of the hotel culture, it's starting to loosen up. Maybe that will spread as well into the institutions and the hotel schools because I was recently in Switzerland just towards the end of last year at La yep. Roche and um, one thing I noticed is they still teach very much traditional yep. hotel methods when it comes to F&B as well as uh, front of house or, or front office. Um, so how, I mean, you, you, you yeah. touched on it a little bit, but do you, do you think that there's also a part of a, an ongoing education? How do, how do we get hotels yeah. that are traditionally set in a certain mindset to perhaps consider things in another way? And, and mm -hmm. as you think about the answer to that question, also think about how are these hotels going to cope with services or technology such as AI and blockchain when it's introduced into their environment when they're already struggling now and, and when everything's moving at such a rapid pace today, it's, it's really changing. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very fascinating field and, and a very good point you mentioned, Andre. Um, the, the really the, the big challenge is what to preserve from the heritage because I think, I, I mean, I went to, the, to Lucerne I had a very classic education and I, I used to work as, a, I was one of the worst F&B managers of the country probably uh, from how I look at F&B today. But from how I learned it, I was very concerned that the plea was in the right order, that the, the food came from the right side, that the waiter, of course, was using the right kind of instrument at the right point of time. And of course, I was concerned about things like dress code and so on. So when we had to go to hotel school, we had to wear a tie. My grandma loved that. Now. Even that school has loosened up um, because they, they feel like this is not how the future of hospitality will look like. Um, when I went, one of the mind-blowing things is I finished that school in 2002. And in 2002, I had my first email address in 1994. So the internet was already existing and it was already existing in a kind of B2, uh, B2B, B2C environment where you could do transactions. So you could book a hotel online. In this very fine school, in the marketing sector, we had two lessons on online marketing. And we had a big discussion on, does a hotel need a website? And the interesting thing looking back was not only that we had this kind of nonsense discussion, which was so 1980 or 19, okay, 1990, <laughs> but um, the interesting thing or the scary thing was the output because the conclusion was um, business hotels, yes, leisure hotels, no because no people, no person in, for his holiday would ever use the internet to book a hotel. When I came back and when we founded SHS, it was 2010, so another eight years down the road and a bit of international chain background in between, 
and uh, four more studies, one of them being in Cornell. And we came back and uh, with the question, I was invited to a panel discussion on does a hotel website need a booking engine? And I was kind of amused by the question, but I went there, of course, because we were in, it was a good platform. And the output of that discussion was a business hotel, yes, but a leisure hotel, no, nobody would book his holiday of more than one night. And one night stay in London, yes. But a, a one week holiday booking online, <laughs> no, no way. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we keep doing the same mistake. So instead of asking ourselves of, oh, there's new technology, how could we use it in the best possible case? Like blockchain, you mentioned. Uh, how can we use blockchain? That's an important question. Um, but we think, uh, we discuss do we actually need blockchain? Do we want blockchain? That's the wrong question, I think. Talking a little bit about, about revenue management and AI, yep. and within the systems that yep. a lot of hotels are using today, they're rapidly evolving and changing as well. Mm -hmm. They're becoming smarter using big data and, and certain algorithms. How do, do you think eventually, just like the potential taxi drivers of the world and bus drivers of the world are going to be replaced by self-driving vehicles. Yeah. Do you think the similar things going to happen in, in not just revenue management mm -hmm. space within hotels, but perhaps also other areas within hotel technology? Of course, there's always going to be a need to have people there mm -hmm. and to work with guests and greet the guests and be hospitable. But I wonder if perhaps there's going to be a large piece taken yeah. away from, from um, an, a person's role. To be honest, I hope so. Um... <laughs> It, it might sound strange. Um, uh, at the moment, 2018 right now, I, uh, these algorithms are not yet ready to fully replace the revenue manager. Mm. I, when I was younger, like 2005 to 2009, I firmly believed that full automation and systems and algorithms uh, do the job better than we do. And we installed these things large scale. Um, and we were thought, taught when 2009 or 2008, 2009 happened um, that our models were wrong, our algorithms were crap. Um, it failed all the way down the line. And we went back to, okay, let's do it ourselves. And at the moment, I think it's great that we get more intelligent systems, but the, the key is not a system or a human person, so AI or HI. I think the, the question is, how do I team up the two? Yeah. Because there are elements of creativity and things that status today, people are better, than computers. Yeah. But there are other things where computers are much better than people. Yeah. So, um, I, and I, I've got a lot of confidence that with the new systems evolving, it's not like this, it's the algorithm or you override it, which means you switch it off. It's more about um, how can the human intelligence, the person, interact with the computer? How the, can the computer and the algorithm help to enlarge the reach? I mean, um, the computer can look at more data and more, I mean, we've got so much data. The computer can kind of screen that much easier, um, but kind of use it in a creative way is a thing that even self-learning systems and algorithms are not able to do today. Mm -hmm. And I clearly want to say this. Sometimes if you talk to a salesperson or to a very kind of, uh, let's say, enthusiastic tech entrepreneur, you get the feeling like it's already there. Mm -hmm. I think it will come, but at the moment, I would rather see us teaming up with the machines instead of having this Terminator style man against machine. Yeah, right, right. The second question, sorry, you asked was a bit about um, how do we think that this will affect? I think um, automation and increased automation is a great, great thing. Um, in all of those fields where the human interaction does not create any value, check in, check out is one of the most obvious things. I mean, queuing up to pay your bill is so nonsense. I hate it. Everyone hates it. Uh, and talking to a human person for doing this stupid process doesn't make it any better. Citizen M is doing a great job mm -hmm. because the check-in is, it's not like a just the kiosk or just the person, it's an assisted check-in. So one person can have six terminals and because this person doesn't have to key in my credit card and identify myself, blah, 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 blah. That's something I can do myself. This person has the time to give me a good greeting, to mm. be a host, mm. to welcome me. Mm. Um, this person at one stage, uh, I went into the, the, the Citizen Amateur Poll and there are two of those. And I booked one 
uh, where I always stay, but uh, it was overbooked, so I booked the other one. So uh, I went into this hotel, I tried to check in, I said, oh no, wrong hotel, so I went back to the subway, and I already was delayed, and it was late, and I checked in, and there was the standard question, so, hi, did you have a good arrival? And I said, honestly, it was really bad today, it was really, really bad. In normal hotels, even in those palace grand hotels that pride themselves of being the best in the world, they think, um, in this situation, the employee is kind of lost behind the desk. Oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, you're now here. Everything will be fine as of this point of time. That's kind of the smartest uh, to be to be to expect answer you get. But this citizen M host, she said, "Are you familiar with our check-in procedures?" I said, "Yeah, totally fine with it." Okay, cool. Because then, can I offer you a beer to make your day a bit better? I said, "Wow." Why that? I said, well, I, I just saw from your passport, you're from Germany, and I thought you might like, like a beer. A beer. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's actually a stupid cliche, but yes, I do. I said, and since it was such a bad day, let's do a large one. Um, shall I serve it right there in the lounge? Mm. And then the, the employee from Classic, what should have been front office, went off to the bar to pour a beer. Mm. Wow, that was mm. added value to me. Mm. Not mm. just because I'm German, I like mm. beers, mm. but this was an intelligent reaction, yeah. which was only possible because there was a self-checking procedure that I could use. Yeah, I have to admit, I, my, I am a fan of Citizen M anyway. I think they <laughs> do, yeah, they do no. it very, very well. I often stayed at that um, Citizen M ship yeah. myself a few times when I used to have to go to Shanghai. So I know that property very well. And um, they've always been exceptionally. To be very, fair with Shippo, I, I love the ground floor. I yeah. think uh, Hyatt Place has got nicer rooms. Yeah. And the same kind of uh, idea with. But the, I mean, honestly, I'm okay with Mike Levy's rooms. I accept them because I, don't, I just use them to sleep there. Yeah, right. And the bed is large. Exactly. Uh, and they're so clever. I, I Every time I go in there, I smile because it goes to the slogan of like a. A bed which is as large it goes from one wall to the other. They didn't say like the walls are so narrow that just the bed just fitted in. Yeah, they said the bed is so large. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always like coming into that little kind of cabinet. I I, I smile and, and listen to that. I think like they're so smart in marketing that small room. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just prop my case. I go down. Mm -hmm. I have a free drink. Exactly. I, I work. I meet people. Like that's great. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, good. The the other firm that I'm, or the other company that I'm a big fan of is uh, Airbnb. SHS. Oh, Airbnb. Oh, SHS, of course, <laughs> but, but also Airbnb. Um, and I'm a fan of them for various reasons, but one of them is because of the variety that you can have with mm -hmm. every time you stay at a different Airbnb. But I also noticed that um, just last week they uh, had a huge conference in San Francisco where they announced uh, Airbnb Plus. Yes. Um, and I'd like to get your take on that because from, from my perspective, I see this as a very strategic move in a certain direction within the industry um, with a very clear target that they have in mind. And it's a shift in, in my mind, it's a, it's a change in the business model, not necessarily the business model, but, but audience that they're going towards. What's your take on that? I'd love to hear your perspective. I'm super excited about it because just to confess, I'm a fan of Airbnb. And I'm just opening the app now, so you see I'm not bullshitting. But um, the the thing is, um, I'm not only a fan of Airbnb, a fan of Airbnb as a guest. I'm also a host on Airbnb. Uh -huh. I rent out a chalet, a beautiful chalet. If you ever want to come to to Closters, uh, close to my Davos. <laughs> and and what I love, uh, by the way, there here you go with the, the backend software. Um, let's stop trying to fight them. Let's ask All ourselves, right. what can we learn from them? Because what they mastered is like, I've got one system, which includes communication, marketing, so I can have all the content management, pricing, um, uh, availability management, so it's kind of a CRS plus an email account plus a website, and it's all in a way that I can use it from my mobile phone with my fat German fingers. I'm, I once set up the content page on a classic laptop, desktop, PC, just because it was more convenient. Ever since I've only working Airbnb on that app, I'd love to do that with Saber C Nexus. Mm. <laughs> I mean, honestly, um, and, and the best thing about it is this software, I mean, I, I come out from a world, I was in the CRS space for a couple of years and I was responsible for two years for corporate training. And we did CRS trainings on two levels, basic and advanced, totaling four days of explaining you how to use the system. I never ever had an Airbnb system training. It's intuitive. Yeah. 
my mom can use it. Yeah. And to be honest, my mom is using it. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And it's even better. My mom was never ever using a computer. We, got, we bought her an iPad when she got retired. And she never got a CRS training and she can use that. And she's a host and she takes part of the globalized world. Yeah. I love Airbnb for that. Yeah. The other thing they got extremely right, um, if you ever kind of see the tonality of how they interact with not only the guests, but also with the host and the users, um, they never came like, here is a 85 pages manual and uh, data rate collection sheet that you have to fill out and actually you need a dictionary to understand our own language. They come like, say, hey, cool, you're a host, it's so easy, sign up and three, for okay. Then you get the first email, say, cool, welcome to the community. You're part of our community now. Community is important, blah, 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 blah. And they say, and the next step, if you want to kind of get your property or your uh, kind of flat or whatever on, so online is you've got to fill out and you've got to tell us a little bit about it. And they step by step in a very positive way, kind of high-fiving you in between yeah, even. Yeah, um, they, yeah. they make you a member of the community. And to be honest, Hotel technology never felt better than with Airbnb. I think that's why they use the heart. Mm, mm, mm. And I know that a couple of hotel colleagues are probably now throwing hard things against their screen. But I think we should learn from Airbnb. Now, yeah. Airbnb, since we didn't learn from them, they're there for a couple of years. We never, ever adapted anything in our distribution mindset world. Some newbies tried to. They did, and they did a good job. But the big legacy companies like the, the Amadeus of the world, it's still the same old stuff. So since we didn't learn and adapt, it's just logic that they say, okay, they're slow, let's just move in that. That's like a lion seeing that one of the zebras is a bit slower and he's just having it for lunch. Mm -hmm. There are some perhaps independent organizations within the industry. And when I say organizations, I mean hotel groups. Yeah that are recognized, recognizing that community approach, yeah. if you like, and they're repositioning their brand to be uh, perhaps more like that. Yeah. Also the experience that they offer to the, the guests as well. So I do think that hotels recognize the, the value in having that type of approach and that, that it is changing. But I think what is interesting is that if you talk to Arnie Sorensen at Marriott mm -hmm. or the uh, CEO of Hilton, both of those guys are still very much in the mindset that Airbnb is not a competitor for us. We, we are offering a, a different service in their mind. And it just tells me two things. Time to sell your Marriott and Hilton shares if yeah. you have some. I haven't. I yeah. bought Accor. It's funny you say that though. Marriott stock is doing very well at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, but I still, if, if this is the mindset of the CEO, I'm not interested in being a shareholder of yeah. such a stupid old school company. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is also, um, you mentioned one thing, there's some brands trying to bring this. When I did my hotel education, brands were a brand promise, a standardized product, you know what you get wherever you are. Now brands are trying to become a little bit like individual hotels, unique right. kind of local flavor. Yeah. So they're becoming like non-brands actually. Yeah. To me, this is a paradox, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is a little bit. But then on the other side, if you look at what Airbnb is doing now as well, it took them 10 years to bring in a membership program. Um, and they're, 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 they're really seeing themselves more, perhaps, as an OTA now on that side. They're, they're, to me, they're actually... an interesting space, To I me, think. Airbnb is a, is a, is a zero-asset hotel. Because, I mean... Well, that it definitely is. And, yeah. and the membership, I, the interesting thing is also that they call it a membership program, not loyalty card. Yeah. Because millennials don't care about loyalty cards that yeah. much. They That's even right. drop out of it. I don't care about... I mean, I'm, I'm too old to be a millennial, but I don't care about loyalty programs anymore. Yeah. And yes, I do collect loyalty points everywhere. Yeah. But it's not increasing loyalty. It's just like they give me free points, so I just take right, them. Right, right, right. It's not about loyalty. It's actually where, what, what, what perks can you eventually get out of it? Well, yeah, and it's also like, I mean, I have to be there anyway, that's okay, I, let's just take it. Uh, yeah. if I, and, and at the end of the year, I'm collecting them before Christmas and buying presents for the kids. Right, exactly. But exactly. The, the interesting thing is, um, Airbnb, they don't own the assets, they don't own the, the mm. employees, they, they own the technology, they have the centralized platform, and they've got the, they are the brand. In the, I mean, you are not a guest of Mrs. Miller somewhere, you're an Airbnb user. You say you love Airbnb, but actually the person who was your host was Mrs. Miller, but you have probably forgotten about her even, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're a promiscuous user of Airbnbs all over the place, yeah. which is perfectly fine, yeah. but you're always Airbnb. So I think that brand loyalty shifts, um, and we, we saw studies a couple of years back that 
there's a larger brand loyalty towards an OTA brand and to a hotel brand. That was step number one. Now Airbnb is going a bit beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe they are a, a smart disruptor of the OTA space. Mm -hmm. Looking at two big players, I would love to have a third one. Mm -hmm. It would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Why not? Indeed, indeed. One last final question, we are out of time. Yep. I'd like to understand what your travel habits are. <laughs> what, what, what is it that's really important for you when you book and how do you book your trips? Okay, there are two things. Um, there's my corporate travel habit. Uh, my corporate travel habit is, is as a hotel consultant, usually driven by the client. Mm -hmm. But what's really important, so I, I'm not really concerned about the hotel booking, somebody else is doing that. Uh, but what's really important for me is like uh, simple things. Um, I arrive there, how do I get to the hotel? I'm at the hotel, can I check in online or do I have to queue? Can I check out online? Because I'm on comp basis, I just have to accept a z zero invoice. I don't want to queue up five minutes for that. Um, so I'm, I'm, and I'm pretty much fairly easy going. I'm late in, early out. Length of stay, one to two nights. Um, so I'm a dream guest for a hotel because uh, the capacity is open for day use the entire day. They don't use it, but it would be. Mm. Um, if I travel on private purpose, it's interesting. I stay with friends, but if I go abroad, I, um, I'm a very, very loyal client of an OTA where I can book everything with the app, mm -hmm. where the communication is through the app. Uh, and I've got only this OTA app and the Airbnb app mm -hmm. to stay somewhere because I trust. I had so much good experience while staying somewhere with this brand. So um, going to India, I had a good experience on OTA X. Cool. Going to Sri Lanka, I used it as well. Why? Because it gave me the trust that everything will be fine. And going to Vietnam or to Cambodia, I might use it again. And the same is with Airbnb. I don't actually, I, I love to stay in individual hotels. I avoid like these cookie cutting, boring mm -hmm. Novotel mm -hmm. kind of style things or Courtyard by Marriott or I couldn't mention many brands now, not to just kind of piggyback on one. But the, the thing is, I love to stay with individual hotels, but I love to book them through a platform I trust. Mm. Um, and there's a third element to it. Um, when I travel, I book a long time in advance or I book very last minute. Okay. There is no in between. So either I know about the trip way in advance and I, I try to fix everything so I got it. I can focus on what I want to see there, not where I'm going to stay, how I'm going to get there, transfers and flights and stuff. Um, or I just arrive in a city and I say, cool, let's stay here for another night. I mean, New York. I once check, is it a super peak demand period when I come to New York? If not, I'm only booking uh, from, J from JFK airport while I'm in an Uber driving to Manhattan. I never do it in advance. Mm -hmm. Why? Because A, there's always availability and B, last minute rates are still big in this city. Yeah. Uh, so why should I book in advance? Um, or I know I'm going there, so I book like four months in ahead, securing the space, ticking it off my list and feeling comfortable. Mm -hmm. So probably it's an atypical kind of behavior. Cool. Misbehavior. Yeah, no one's called cool behavior. Very good, Wilco. Great Thank to you very much. It was good so to be much here. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your Great chance. Sorry for running out of time. No, it's no problem at all. <laughs> Great <laughs> to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Folks, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that episode, please make sure you subscribe, hit the bell button for more. Uh, we'll be coming back very soon with some great episodes as well. So for now, it's out and ciao and goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye.